staying here on the Joy News channel. So you just saw Interior Minister Ambrose Berry appearing uh, before the Commission of Inquiry into the Ayawasu West work on by-election violence. And he's been saying a couple of things, notable amongst them. Let me start in the order in which he delivered his testimony as he was questioned by um, lawyer Eric Mensa. He's leading the commission to gather evidence from uh, these people appearing before the commission. Now, he says that he got to know about the violence by watching TV. Um, he spoke to the IGP, and the IGP had told him that he was aware of the incident and that at around 8.30 p.m. a complaint was lodged at the airport police station and police officers headed to the residence of the NDC candidate and offered protection and uh, also started investigation and visited him. And um, he's also uh, been talking about the issue of vigilantism and argues that he would rather we do not attach uh, the political tag to it and that it's a crime and that he agrees that they must be dealt with okay and um, he also did mention that there's a need for education when he was asked on specific strategy to deal with the issue uh, but he did state though that for what his mandate is it will strictly be to enforce the law he however adds that they are working with organizations like the ncce to do the other bits including education and, and now he said emphatically that the igp told him that the masked men we saw there were not deployed by the ghana police service or part of persons deployed by the Ghana Police Service. All right. So uh, the next witness is ready. I will we'll be taking you shortly, even as he uh, takes his oath. Aye. I, I Alexander. Hereby swear by the Bible. Hereby swear by the Bible. That the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth shall be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth so help me God so help me God please be reminded that by the oath you've taken you have made a promise to speak the truth and failure to do so constitutes an offense for which you be liable to punishment thank you Honorable, you're welcome. Thank you very much. And can I please uh, plead, uh, Chairman, Honorable Members of the Commission, that before I submit myself to the questions that the Commission may want to put to me, can I humbly appeal that I take the opportunity to make uh, a couple of remarks? Very well. You are permitted, Honorable. Thank you. So, Honorable Chairman and Honorable Members of the Commission, I have been told that as the Minister for National Security and because of the sensitivity of the issues that I normally deal with, I should demand that I give my evidence in camera and not in public. I have rejected this advice. I've rejected this advice because I believe openness and transparency are crucial to the work of this commission on this very, very important matter. Beyond this, unlike all Ghanaians, I have full confidence, respect for this commission and the honorable members. And I'm proud that the president selected you to constitute the commission. It is expected that in the course of the work of this commission, I believe you will consider the issue of political vigilantism and help to find a lasting solution. On our chairman, the views of the president on political vigilantism are well known, well articulated. He is of the firm belief that it poses a major threat to our democracy and must be stopped immediately. 
an honorable chair, my man who personal views on political vigilantism are clear and known to many Ghanaians. Three days before the events of the uh, 31st January, uh, that is at the by-election, I talked about the dangers of political vigilantism at a round table that was organized by the National Peace Council with support from the UK Embassy. And last week at Peduyasi, my ministry organized a security dialogue to deliberate on vigilantism. It brought together six ministers of state, including the senior minister, chairman of the parliamentary select committee on defense and interior, members of the security and intelligence community, including the uh, IGP, members from academia, religious bodies, and civil society. Honorable Chairman, we thoroughly examined and discussed the security threat associated with political vigilantism. And if I may add, uh, this forum had been organized even before the events that led up to the setting up of this uh, commission. And I say it to illustrate uh, how determined we are that as a nation we address this uh, important issue of political vigilantism. And on which at the end of our deliberations uh, in Piduasi, after listening also to a presentation by the Center for Democratic Development, all of us came to the conclusion that putting an end to the activities of political vigilante groups must be a top priority. The activities of vigilantism in Jamaica, in Rwanda, and religious vigilantism in Nigeria should warn us. And we also do know that the majority of Ghanaians disapprove of their activities. Honorable Chairman and members, we were, in fact, at Piduyase when the announcement of the setting up of this commission was announced. Indeed, the Executive Secretary, Mr. Abuchi, was there. All of us healed this, the setting up of this uh, commission. And to most of us at Piduyase, this commission must have the duty to save our democracy. And I just want you to know that Ghana demands a solution to political vigilantism from this commission. There have been far too many cases of violence by hired thugs in our elections. In the past, these incidents have not been in investigated and people found to have misconducted themselves sanctioned. It's not too late. We need to do something. Unless we sanction and punish those who misconduct themselves, we cannot expect to have an end to this. Honorable Chairman, I'm most grateful. Thank you. Very well. <clears throat> Honorable, in line with the mandate of the commission, I'm supposed to ask you questions and hope that you give us the necessary answers as well as any proof being documentary evidence or whatever you may have in your possession. Now, you are the Minister for National Security, am I right? I am. Honorable, can you describe to the Commission what the specific mandate of your ministry is? <clears throat> The specific functions of the Minister for National Security are, first of all, I oversee the security and intelligence agencies in the country. I provide them with appropriate orientation. I provide them with guidance and direction to the security and intelligence agencies and indeed the national security apparatus. Foreign Chairman, I also oversee the development and implementation of the security policies which would have been uh, adopted by the Council or as directed by the 
president uh, of the nation. I am supposed to present a national security policy to parliament once uh, every four years and to communicate national security issues to parliament and also to the general public. Uh, in, in summary, these constitute the duties of the national security minister. Very well. Honorable, now help the commission understand. Now we, we understand besides your ministry, there is a minister of state in charge of national security. Is there an overlap between your duties? The minister of state uh, for national security uh, is, if you like, my deputy. Very well. Honorable, if you may explain further what you mean by the Minister of State in charge of security being your deputy, does it mean he takes direct instructions from you? Being the Minister? He is supposed to take instructions from me, but not on everything that he does. I mean, similarly, I do have a national security coordinator who is supposed to take instructions from me, but he doesn't wait for my specific approval before he undertakes any uh, activity. He will later tell me about what he has done and uh, for my information, yes. So from this answer you've just given, does it mean that you will be ultimately responsible for the actions and inactions of the Minister of State in charge of national security? To the extent that he was carrying out the uh, legitimate duties of the ministry. Now, are you aware of the reported incidents of violence at the Ayawaso West Wogon constituency on the 31st day of January 20? 19 during a by election i am myself also in the country at the time but i have to give you a brief as is normally the case and more specifically are you aware of shooting incidents or reported shooting incidents that took place in the said constituency yes i have uh, been told of uh, an incident near one of the polling stations uh, in the constituency, yes. Are you also aware of another incident in which a member of parliament is alleged to have been assaulted? Yes, uh, I have been briefed on that and I've seen it on television as well. Now, as the Minister for National Security, have you been given any after incident report? Yes, we've had a series of uh, meetings for me to get uh, an understanding of what uh, happened, and especially the role of the SWAT team that uh, would you? Part in the operation. Would you in this regard be in position to share with the commission what this report says? Mr. Chairman, there is a special unit at the Ministry for National Security. Swati, they call it. And I want to say that it is not of a recent creation. It's been part of the national security architecture of this country for years, probably 20 years. It has uniformed policemen. And I'm told there were occasions where there were uniformed 
military personnel and also uniformed personnel from the uh, immigration service. They also have some national security operatives who assist them in the discharge of their work. In recent times, since we've been there, the team is made up of policemen and some national security uh, operatives. I believe the number of policemen that we have today is about 25 uh, of them. But as I said, there always has been a SWAT team. The national security operatives who support them, who help them, are part of the national security operatives, informants that we normally employ. We have about 1,000 such operatives in the country, and they are deployed all over the country. They do some guard duties, essentially. And you will find that if you go to most of our installations, um, there will be some guards there. They are part of the national security operatives. There are some at the harbors. There are some at the airports. There are some at, the gov at various government uh, offices. As I said, you know, we have 1,000 such operatives deployed all over the country. Mr. Chairman, about 100 of them are based at the National Security Headquarters. And they normally assist the police team, the SWAT team, as we call them, on patrol duties. And they also help the police to provide rapid response to security challenges. These hundred people will normally join the police to undertake uh, patrol duties uh, in the night and in the day if the need arises. On that Thursday, the SWAT team, I'm advised, deployed system men comprising 25 uniformed police uh, officers and 35 national security operatives. They were under the command of a deputy superintendent of police, Mr. Kodu Azugu, who is the commander of the SWAT team. Honorable Chairman, as per our standard practices, the national security operatives are not allowed to hold weapons during operations. And I'm advised that on that Thursday operation, the operatives did not carry guns. On the other hand, all the uniformed policemen who were part of the operation were armed. Chairman, for any operation, the commander, the deputy superintendent of police, will obtain the approval of the director of operations at the National Security uh, Secretariat, who is a military man, in fact, a colonel, called Colonel Opuku. So the team that went on that operation was under the command of a deputy superintendent of police, and it had been approved 
the operation itself had been approved by the director of operations at the National Security uh, Secretariat. I'm told, Honorable Chairman, that for this operation, they acted based on intelligence report that there were weapons in a building within the constituency where the by-election was to take place. They therefore mounted surveillance around the place so that they can stop the use of the weapons and if it was possible to retrieve the weapons without any confrontation, they would do so. They were to find that that building happened to be a building which was being used as the operational headquarters for the NDC candidate. So when they got there, they realized that some caution was needed before they were accused of having broken into the house of one of the parliamentary uh, candidates. So they were in the area watching how things would develop. While in the vicinity, and while they were conducting the surveillance operations, they encountered Honorable Sam George of the NDC, who came in a car that I'm told also carried a deputy women's organizer of the NDC and another lady. They had been driven away from a polling station where they were escorted by 15 people on motorbikes. And this was in defiance of the interparty agreement that no motorbike should be taken to a, poli a polling station. So there was a little bit of confusion at that polling station. And we are told that it took the intervention of an elder statesman, the Honorable Oku Van Dapoy, who talked to Honorable Sam George, and Honorable Sam George left that polling station with the people on Mutu bikes. Honorable Chairman, my information is that when they left that polling station, they all rushed into that house, which was under surveillance. When the SWAT team later attempted to go closer the house, the inmates started pelting them with stones. And later, they also said they heard gunshots coming from within the compound of the house. The, uh, our boys then gave some six warning shots, which they tell me did not hit anybody. But obviously, I await the end of the investigations to find out exactly what happened and how many shots they fired and whether it did uh, hit somebody. For now, the commander tells me that the gunshot wound, one person was shot or had a gunshot a wound, whether it was a gunshot wound or not, we can only wait for the investigations to find out. Um, they believe that that shot did not come from the warning shots that they gave, but probably the one from within the uh, compound. They do not even remember seeing any such person on the ground and that the person who was shot came from 
uh, that compound. But all these things, your uh, honorable, cha honorable chairman, we will find out the truth, hopefully, after the end of the investigations. And you also did ask about the incident involving the honorable oh. member of parliament. That yeah. is so. Yes, I have been given a, a briefing, and I am told that after the first incident, and when they had dispersed but were within the vicinity, the honorable member started shouting that somebody had been killed in his presence, that he saw the person being killed, or because of by-election, he kept saying so. And in fact, I have heard him saying that on television as well. My information is that a member of the SWAT team then did remind, reminded him. A member of the SWAT team reminded him that, Honorable, you are causing fear and panic. It is not true that anybody died at that incident. We were there. You were causing fear and panic, and you should stop that. Apparently, the honorable member of parliament did not take kindly to that, went towards where the, uh, the, the boy was standing, the uh, operative was standing, the operative also bet him halfway, and I understand uh, he was uh, hit by the um, operative. I want also to emphasize that all those who were in uniform are regular police men and uh, officers. That there was no member who belonged to the national security operatives who was in police uniform. The SWAT team at the national security headquarters has some vehicles allocated to them for their day-to-day -day use. Some of them come from the police and are painted in police uh, colors. Some are not painted. They belong to the national security, but they are available for the uh, SWAT team to use as and when uh, necessary. We are also told that they had covered their faces. Uh, that is nothing new. These same operatives, Honorable Chairman, in the past, have dis been displayed openly during uh, National Independence Day celebrations. When security agencies come to display with their weapons, with their equipment, these boys normally go there as part of the display. When they go, they are dressed no differently than they were dressed when they undertook this uh, operation. So they have always uh, been part of the SWAT team. From the way they operate, they take instructions from the police, and as I said, they are not allowed to uh, hold weapons. If indeed somebody who is not a uniformed policeman and member of the SWAT team did use any weapon that would go against the normal rules of engagement and that should call for sanctions. Honorable. <clears throat> By operatives, are you referring to the masked men in brown uniform? seen on the day? 
again, I'm not sure who was masked and who was it. I have asked that question, and I'm told that some of the uniformed policemen also had the mask on. So it was not only the operatives, if you like, call them the civilian operatives, who were wearing the mask uh, on that day. That is the information I have been given by the commander. Honorable, these civilian operatives, are they officially part of our security arrangement? Officially? These um, civilians have been part of the national security architecture for years. It's not something that has recently been created. Are for they, years. Are they properly trained? They are properly trained for the work that they do. Most of the 1,000 people provide guard duties. They are trained. They have been given some training to do that. About 100 of them are normally kept in the uh, headquarters to assist the police when they go out on patrol duties. They have been given such training as is necessary to be able to provide support. But remember, they don't go out carrying guns and they do not undertake operations on their own. It must be as commanded by the commander and it must be with uh, uniformed policemen. Honorable, you have been emphatic that the uniformed men were police officers. Am I right? Certainly. Now, are you aware that the director in charge of operations of the police on the day denied knowledge of these men? I heard it. I asked him. His response was that I had just gotten out of my car when the media men asked me whether I knew the people. And he said, no, I, I, I don't even know the people that you're referring to. So when he said he didn't know them, he was only saying the natural thing. I've only just gotten out of my car. I need to know the people that you're referring to uh, before I can make any such comment. But for now, I don't know them. That was the answer he gave to me. Honorable, would you be surprised if I should tell you that this commission this morning has been told that according to the IGP, he was not aware of the presence of the masked men in brown uniform. Would you be surprised? If you buy the masked men, you mean the SWAT team, then probably I can understand where he's coming from. Or by the masked men, you're talking about the, um, the SWAT team. So let me tell you why that can possibly arise. The system today has been that a unit and as I say, comprising of 25 policemen and one officer, are assigned to the national security. The commander does not take instructions from the director of operations of the Ghana Police Service. Therefore, it is possible that that team will undertake an operation unknown to the director of operations of the Ghana Police Service. But that has been the system all these years. I have heard it question whether we should probably not think about the possibility of getting the SWAT team commander reporting on a daily basis to the Director General of Operations instead of to the Director of Operations at the National Security uh, council worth considering, probably. Now, has it come to your attention that some of these 
security operatives, as you described them, were actually stationed at polling stations and that they had guns which were visible to the whole world. That would be strange. That, that, that is news to me. And I cannot understand uh, the possibility of something like this. If they are using guns, there will be guns that would have been issued to them at the national security uh, headquarters. We have not done anything. My advice is that they did not issue any such weapons. It would be very, very odd if they did. Honorable, you have admitted this morning before this commission that some of the operatives in the house of a candidate had to shoot warning shots, if you like. And now you are also saying that these operatives do not wield guns. If I may ask, who shot these warning shots? The team that I refer to comprised 25 uniformed policemen. Each one of them had a weapon. And 35 operatives, none of them had a weapon. And therefore, the civilian operatives, if you want, could not have fired a shot. If a shot was fired, and I have already said that my information is that six warning shots were fired by the SWAT team. They were all fired by uniformed policemen. Very well. Now, you have indicated to this commission that their presence was upon a tip of, of weaponry hiding in a particular house. Am I right? Yes, I did. Very well. Um, Honorable, you agree with me that we've had several elections in this country, being a by or general or any other election. You will agree with me, won't you? Yeah, I do. And that never have we had the presence of such men at any of our polling stations. Do you agree? Well, not necessarily so. I mean, one cannot say with certainty that the SWAT team has never been used in any election. I, I, I don't think that can be right. If I may be more specific. Mm. Security operatives wearing masks, obviously disguising their identity, have never been used at polling stations. Am I right? If ever some operatives had been used at a polling station, I'm sure they would have been so dressed in the past. Do I take it you can neither confirm nor deny? No, I can never, I, I cannot confirm or deny that they have never, there has never been the involvement of the uh, SWAT team in any election. And please, it, it is also important to emphasize that this team did not go there because of a by-election. They didn't go for by-election duties. By-election security is provided by the police. This team was there because they had intelligence that there were weapons in a particular uh, building. And if Again, we wait for the investigation. If it turns out to be true that shots came from within that compound, it will only go to, to prove that they were right in doing, in deciding to mount the surveillance that they did. They were not there because of the election, by election now. Honorable, would you also agree with me that the presence of these masked men was likely to have intimidated voters? 
and probably cause some people not to vote. The place where the incident took place was, my Lord, not a polling station. That, that house wasn't a polling station. And their being around that vicinity could not have frightened anybody. Please get it right. They were not there as part of the security provided by the state for the by-election. No. That is not the brief, the information that has been given to me. Very well. There is this general belief within the country, and that actually forms a conversation going around, that this group you describe as security operatives are actually part of a vigilante grouping within the new patriotic party. What do you have to say about that? Definitely not true. Definitely not true. If the suggestion is that included in the operatives are people who on normally belong to a particular vigilante group. Uh, no, that, that, that would be surprising. If some of them in the past had participated in some vigilante groups, that probably could be uh, possible. But, Mr. Chairman, it is important to know about these political vigilante groups that we have in the country. There isn't one political vigilante group that belongs to a political party. The CDD has just come up with a study which establishes that these vigilante groups are owned by some individuals, some kingpins within the political parties. So the NPP hasn't got a vigilante group per se. There are vigilante groups that probably people associate with them. If you go into it, you will find that these are not uh, vigilante groups of the party. Now, on the subject of vigilante groups in the country, you being the minister in charge of security of the country, are you aware of the presence of vigilante groups in the country? Honorable Chairman, not just that I'm aware, but it constitutes one of my greatest challenges. If you ask me to list the national security challenges that we have in the country, that will be found among the very top ones. Which is why, in my opening statement, I said three days before this particular incident, I had spoken at a round table organized by the National Peace Council and had expressed my concern, had warned Ghanaians that unless we find a solution to this uh, political vigilantism, our democracy will continue to be under threat. And in fact, even before this incident, I had also arranged for the political class, for the religious uh, groups, people from the academia, people from the security and intelligence agencies. We had all planned, and in fact, it did take place. And as I said, your executive secretary was there in his capacity as an uh, academician who uh, has been known to have studied this particular program. We all met. And it was the conclusion, it was the belief of all of us that if ever there is 
a serious challenge to the future of our democracy. It will come from this. Boko Haram started as a religious a vigilante group. And today, look at where they have advanced to. The whole of the Nigerian security forces are unable to conquer them. We know what vigilantism did in places like Rwanda, in Jamaica. We need to be able to stop this thing called vigilantism. Very well, honorable. Um, <clears throat> Having identified the danger vigilantism posed to our society and given your conviction to find solutions, if I may ask specifically, what have you done? What measures have you put in place to get rid of vigilantism in our country? <clears throat> the police, the security agencies, have been given firm instructions that vigilantism is crime. And anybody who indulges in it should be uh, punished as per the laws of this uh, country. The president has given specific instructions to the uh, IGP on this matter. I have given similar instructions to the security and intelligence agencies that I control. When we organized the retreat at Piduyasi, it was all in search of finding a lasting solution to this. And I don't want to preempt what they intend to do from that retreat, but I know that efforts are being made to start a civil society led encounter to try to bring everybody in the country, the political actors, to come up with a declaration that they do not accept uh, political vigilantism uh, within their parties. And as I also said in my opening remarks, I believe this uh, commission can also help us. This commission can help because of the, the, the respect that Ghanaians have come to associate with the commission. I believe we can also get uh, some directions from the work of this uh, commission. You see, my lord, if crime is not punished, it encourages others to do it. If Kojo did it and was able to get away with it, why should Ama not do it? We've had this thing this sort of violence associated with by elections in the country over so many years. There has not been one occasion when one has been properly investigated and those found to have misconducted themselves punished. So why should they just not try it? I hope this commission can take a holistic view and find a solution to this uh, evil, but it may well mean, and I don't want to suggest anything, it may well mean that we look at all instances where people have misconducted themselves just because of an election. At Peduasi, we had a look at what actually causes this sort of political vigilantism. And I think the experts came up with uh, some interesting answers. What I did notice was that unless a firm action is taken, there is everything to motivate political actors to continue to use these vigilante groups. We need to take a firm action. Very well. Honorable Minister. <clears throat> now, we are all aware that there is an upcoming general election even though it's two years away, but it's not that far. And this incident that's taking place ha, 
caused anxiety among the populace. What specific measures are you putting in place to ensure that what occurred at the Ayawasu West Wogon constituency will not be repeated during the next general election? There is this belief that what happened at Ayawaso, as it relates to the national security, was the work of some vigilante, party vigilante group being used by the national security. I have said that is not the case, and I want that to be on record. But yes, what happened now teaches us that all of us will be in danger of surrendering the democracy that we think we have in 2020 if something is not done uh, about this problem uh, today. As far as the government is concerned, the setting up of this commission to properly investigate and find out what happened and to prescribe appropriate sanctions for those who misconducted themselves we think that is the first step towards eliminating this sort of canker from our system. People undertake crime because others were not sanctioned. It is important that we sanction people. Nobody goes through the red light in the advanced countries because everybody knows the consequences. We go through the red light here because we know there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be any sanction. This commission, I believe, is God sent. Go into it, find out exactly uh, what happened. It may be more than I have been told. Find out exactly what happened, and let us be bold as a country to hold people who misconducted themselves accountable and let us sanction them. When that sanction comes, it will offer serious pieces of advice to people who are contemplating to do similar things in the future. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for your testimony. I have a few questions that I need clarified. Um, you talked about how the national security people found themselves in that area on that day. And you indicated that they acted on an intelligence report and that it was when they got there that they found it was a home or house of the NDC candidate. Am I correct? Not, not house in terms of residence. He doesn't live there, but he was using, or he has been using that building, I think, as a warehouse. Uh, but whatever the use that he normally uses it for, that day it was more or less one of the operational headquarters of the NDC candidate. You said it was when they arrived that they discovered this. You mean the intelligence did not disclose who owned the place? They, they found out when they got there that the place was owned by the uh, NDC candidate. The intelligence must have told them earlier before going there. Or they must have found it when they got there. I need to get an answer to this specific question from the commander. I would appreciate hearing the answer myself mm. because I cannot believe that an intelligence report that guns or at least arms and ammunition are being stockpiled in a particular locality and no effort would be made to find who owned it before operatives moved in there. 
it depends upon when, when they got the intelligence and the time available to them to have gone to do an earlier surveillance. Uh, uh, it, it, it's not something surprising to me that they go there only to find that it belonged to a particular person. But again, it's important we know the exact position. And this, I believe, we will get it from the uh, commander himself. At what point in time did he get the intelligence? Because the place was near a polling station. Yes. It was a public election. So a lot of members of the public were expected to go there to exercise their civic duty. Mm. So if people who were armed were being moved to conduct an operation in that area, I suspect that it would require a bit more planning, a bit more caution, so that no member of the public would be hurt. You are right. And it wasn't that exactly what they did. When they got there and realized that it was within the vicinity of a polling station, they stayed uh, out of it. They didn't just rush into the house until they had calls to go closer to the place when people with 15 motorbikes were there and uh, things were becoming suspicious. The only reason they did not go into the house immediately was because they must have said to themselves, uh, well, there is an election here. Don't let us cause undue commotion, I suspect. When they discovered that it was near a polling station, did they make contact with the operational commander for that day for ele election duties? You know, I wouldn't know much about the details that day. I think uh, the commander who uh, was in charge should give answers to such important questions. Okay, so we may need to t speak with the commander of the operation. Certainly. Okay. You indicated that they fired six warning shots and that the shots hit nobody. That is the report that has been given to me by the commander again. I believe it should be subjected to some investigation, some analysis to find out whether what he has told me is correct. But yes, he's giving me that information. Has there been any forensic evidence of oh, the, the um, bullets, the location, and anything else from the person who was hit. The, any such investigation will not come from within the national uh, security. It will come from this commission or probably the police. So n no investigation has been done at the national security uh, office to establish uh, the truth in some of these things. May I ask then, what are the protocols for using firearms in this armed um, unit? That it must be the same protocols as obtained within the Ghana Police Service. Remember, all those who can use weapons are policemen. They belong to the Ghana Police Service. It is just that they are working in that unit. And so the police are investigating whether there were a breach of any of these protocols on use of firearms? It's a standard uh, procedure. So if there had been breaches, if people did not follow the uh, rules of engagement, I expect that uh, some uh, investigation will be conducted. And Who's you see, it's very, very important for us that it gets done. Who issued the, them the firearms? The, the director of operations and the police commander. The armory that we have at the National Security Council is under the control of the director of uh, operations, Kenelo Poku. Uh, weapons are issued to the commander for distribution. Then surely they must have 
protocols that are specific to the use of those arms. I cannot imagine them not having such protocols, yes. You are not aware that they do? I do not go into those uh, nitty gritties. Uh, these are operational matters. Who would be aware? The uh, commander will be aware. The um, director of operations will be aware. And the national security coordinator who does the technical aspects of my work will also be aware. So we may ask yeah. them for information. Yes. And I think it's important we have such information. Because they were so sure it wasn't their guns that caused the injury. So they must have known something. I have asked repeatedly, and they say that uh, it did not come from their guns. I think the investigations should seek to unearth the truth. Does, this does anybody have the spent cartridges? Did they report to the headquarters with the spent cartridges? I'm sure they, they did. I cannot say that uh, I have looked at them, but it is the normal practice that they normally pick uh, such cartridges and use it as part of their reporting. You talked about how normal it is for these people to wear masks. I can understand them showing off their prowess on Independence Day. But when they move into a civilian area, highly built up area, next to a polling station, is it not odd well, that they would wear masks? Not, not really. I think the important thing is that it, they, they needed to have made it possible for them to be recognized. They wore uh, T-shirts which had the inscription National Security. Anybody can written. make a T-shirt, sir. Well, but to me, that was enough to let people know that they do come from this particular uh, place. You see, you, you give it the impression that the, the back that they wore was primarily to prevent people knowing who they were and who that particular person is. No. Who did must or not, the commander knew who they were individually. But the people who employ them, the public, did not know. And people, members of the public, have been attacked by armed robbers wearing masks. How were they not to make an I've association seen, between the two? I have seen a lot of operations by a policeman in Ghana outside where these policemen also have been wearing, uh, you know, They've got masks, which makes it impossible for you to know exactly who they are. The, uh, the way they normally dress. Uh, I don't really see the problem in that, per se. But if you think it constitutes a problem, yes, let us go into that one uh, as well. We, we, we are prepared to review some of these things if it is established that uh, it will help. The, the, the usefulness of having a committee, a commission such as this. Thank you. Now, those who deployed, you said the questions you can't answer. So, if you can't answer, that's okay. We will ask them. But it, it, did it occur to anybody that with two parallel command and control uh, situations in the same area, that there would be confusion? There was no. Uh, Parallel command and control. The elections were being held you know, under. This was not something that happened at a polling station. These people were at a different place. They were not part of the security for the by elections. We need to draw that distinction. So it wasn't that the, the security for the by elections that was being provided by a joint team under the control of the Director General operations of the police. This was an operation about the possible hoarding of weapons in a house within that vicinity. So there were no parallel command and control now. They were not doing the same job. I would have agreed with you if I hadn't had read a Kodeo report in the media about one such person um, manhandling a police officer on duty at a polling station in a completely different area. 
Uh, That's why I'm a little surprised that they were not part of any election duty. I've asked the same question to my uh, commander that I have heard it said that there was a national security operative part of SWAT who was manhandling somebody elsewhere. They say that uh, they are not aware, and it would be odd that a member of their team would have on his own gone elsewhere to do that sort of thing. I've tasked them to find out the truth in that. So maybe we should also find the I truth we, we in should. that? I think we should. And I believe if that was what happened, that would be uh, something that we, 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 we should be able to interrogate and to uh, sanction if necessary. You said that it was possible that some of the people in this SWAT team may have, been, may have participated in some vigilante groups in the past? It is possible. How are these people recruited? They are recruited based upon their expression of interest. They will come to us. They want to work uh, for the national security. We know we have a number that we necessarily must get to be able to provide the duties that they do. We need people to be, um, to be at the harbors, for instance. We need people to be at the uh, ports. We need people to be guarding official buildings and places uh, like that. So we do normally. And again, I know that you have a few, few rude young women at the airport. Uh, rude? Yes. Never knew about a rude woman before. I have encountered <laughs> okay. them on my way out of Ghana. See, you, see, you see, Prof, how important it is that we get such things reported to us so we can uh, investigate. When you employ so many people, it is possible that it happens. We, we try. We try as much as possible. And I always insist on it that those who are at the airport should see themselves as ambassadors for the country. When we hear instances of people trying to solicit for you know, financial help from passengers and whatnot, we take very, very serious view. We don't think uh, people at the airport in particular uh, should be discourteous at all. No, it's, it's, it's not good for the image of the country. So it is at, at all material times they are known to be delivering a service? Not all the security agents that you find, say, at the airport will be one of these operatives. They may well be from the BNI, from the RD from immigration, uh, from other security uh, agencies. So uh, if one is discourteous, it is not necessarily uh, from the national security operatives. But I'm not suggesting that they are incapable of that. I hope they are given an outlook of service as they go on duty. But back to the arms. The people were deployed to go and check because of some intelligence received. Did they succeed in going to check? Did they find any arms then or since? For, 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 very important question. But we've also tried to find out. Uh, following the incident, and because of the fact that it was... Uh, an operational headquarters for one of the candidates. They did not think it was tactical for them to force themselves into the compound and to conduct uh, the searches that normally would have been necessary. Then how did they come to fire six warning shots? Again, we're investigating, but I have been told that the shots, the first number of shots, came from within the compound. The warning shots were in response to shots that came from that compound. And as they will let me believe, they strongly believe that the person who had that gunshot wound did not have it outside of the premises. Again, we need to interrogate and go into this and find out the, 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 the truth. 
it's been about two weeks since this happened. And national security has not investigated. This is an investigation to be undertaken uh, by the uh, police service. And I, I suspect that they are uh, undertaking the necessary investigations. It is also important that the um, commanders at the national security should also be tried to find uh, answers to some of these nagging questions. That is what I was hoping I would hear. Yeah. That within uh, after, national security, up till now I've not had any. You also the investigate these things because when you send people out on operation, at a minimum they must come and report what happened, yeah. and if there have been injuries or fatalities, they they are supposed to make a full report. They are supposed to do forensic tests so that we know where the bullet came from. They must be sure the bullet did not come from them. But if they just come and report that, well, we fired six shots, but nobody was injured. If somebody was injured, they shot themselves or something like that. Shouldn't the institution be interested in um, the disciplinary aspects of their operations? Well, um Investigations should be conducted, but technical investigations such as this, which involves the forensic analysis and whatnot, will normally be undertaken by the police. They have the, that is the, the police uh, headquarters, not the police unit uh, that we have. They wouldn't have the expertise to be able to do that. And again, uh, who is auditing the auditor? Yeah, who they is auditing the, the auditor indeed? Yeah. You alarmed me by saying that um, these groups, so-called vigilante groups, I insist they are militia groups, that they belong to individuals, which has alarmed me that we have uh, warlordism also on our hands, and that they don't belong to the parties, but belong to individuals within the parties. Am I correct? That's, I, was that's what alarmed. I was as alarmed, my, Madam, myself, uh, to hear this. But this is based on an authentic by the CDD, and the report is available. That means that these people answer only to particular people. We need to um, probe into that further. But yes, that is the suggestion that is being given. And I look at it... And I say to myself, ah, this could be true, you know, or this is true. Because I don't believe that among the listed assets of any of the political parties is a vigilante uh, group. So the president is commander-in-chief, and you have other mini commanders-in-chief heading in the interstices of the parties. Madam, that is the danger that we are trying to address. We will have a government in a country solely for the purpose of providing public goods and public services. That is why we have a government anywhere in the world. The provision of security and safety to citizens is a public service which must be undertaken by the, uh, the government, the state. It's the first duty. Yes, the first duty. If anybody else tries to take over that duty, that responsibility, then we are all in trouble. That is why we are all crying. That if you are not careful, you will get to the point where... Sir, be I can cry, but you can't cry. You have responsibility. That is why on a daily basis I'm working towards it. And indeed, madam, uh, unlike you, I'm aware, I have practical examples of the dangers that loom ahead. So, yes, you may be able to cry. I can assure you, I can never sleep because of these things. I lose sleep when I think about them and continuously be working towards that. Remember, as a government, we have made it clear to Ghanaians that we are against this thing. We've said it not because it serves our politics to, to say so, but because we are very, very clear in our mind 
that a great danger to the democracy that we've all come to enjoy is endangered if you don't stop this parallel provision of security services in the country. Sir, so you've successfully taken away my sleep. <laughs> So We've been told that the police, through the Ministry of Interior, are developing a strategy for dealing with this matter. Is your outfit a part of the development of this strategy? We think together. They undertake things uh, on their own, but we think together. All these things would have been considered by the, um, by the security ministers and the security uh, council, the implementation will be made by various uh, agencies, probably under different uh, ministries. I'm talking of the strategy level, not the operational. Because if they are now developing a strategy, then I expect that your outfit would be a part of developing the, the, the strategy. There's a strategy to, to do what? Um, to deal with these uh, militia groups. Oh, yes. As I said, we, we've been having uh, discussions, we've been having retreats, we've been talking to people. We've not even limited finding the solution to the political class alone. We're talking to the real experts down there on the field. We're talking to um, the security and intelligence operatives who are working now. We're talking with all due respect to uh, people like the former IGPs who understand these issues. It is something that Ghana must get right. And in finding a solution, we try not to politicize it or to take it as something that we alone can do. There has been very, very uh, wide consultation. We will continue to do that. And we will hope that, again, with the efforts that is being made through this commission, we will be able to find a solution. Let me just reiterate that, please, it is in everybody's interest that we do find a solution uh, to this uh, danger. You are um, talking about this matter keeping you awake. It's been your major national security challenge. Have you deployed your intelligence resources to finding out about these groups who funds them, and all of those things. Because the funding is very important. That's what produces these other militia groups in the Sahel and so on that we are all concerned about. But, Madam, it's not my number one security challenge today. It is one of my major security uh, challenges. I stand I think, corrected. I think that... Uh, should be uh, emphasized. It certainly is one of the key national security threats that we have uh, in this country. And in finding the solutions, gathering relevant intelligence is very, very important, as you rightly suggest. And we do uh, have our intelligence agencies working on it. Um, let me not go into the details. But for instance, it is important for us that we find out where the money is coming from. At first, we probably had taken that easy belief that, oh, the political parties uh, were providing it. We have been told by this CDD study, for instance, that no, it is provided by certain groups within the parties. So where do they get the monies from? And why are they spending their monies that way? I can assure you that the intelligence agencies are hard at work trying to unravel the mystery behind all these things. Thank you very much. It won't make me sleep better till I know you have found a solution. But at least it tells me that you are putting some muscle behind it. Now, does your outfit intend to do some more investigation on this CDD finding so that you, you, you move it from an academic study or research to actually developing strategy to deal with it or a blueprint for, for, for dealing with it. Because um, 
It wasn't only the CDD study. As I said, all the experts from academia, from the security agencies, former uh, security gurus, it, it, it met. And there were a whole lot of issues that came up. One of it being the one that came from the um, CDD. I know that there is a major effort that is going to be made by a, a, a group of civil society uh, groups uh, who want to take it upon themselves to try to find a solution. Because in their opinion, the solution must be a civil society led, not led by the uh, politicians. At the core of the problem, Madam, is the mistrust among the political uh, actors. So probably a solution can come from there. But again, specifically with respect to what the CDD did, yes, we have taken the decision that we probably must even, um, uh, I think I can disclose, as much as possible, we even want to provide more funding for them to do more intensive uh, work in this area. Mr. Minister, one last question for you. Are those in charge of our security failing us? No, 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 no. You have serious challenges. Don't let me tell you about the other challenges. But uh, we are working very, very hard. The statistics don't suggest that we're getting into any state of insecurity. The evidence is there that we are really studying the program. We've improved upon our intelligence the gathering capabilities, we are making the necessary investment. Uh, some of the statistics, Madam, will alarm you. You know, this is the, 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 the state of, say, the, the logistics uh, that was available to the various security agencies in terms of equipment, stuff like that. We have done a lot to improve upon them. It's not just expecting the police to do well, you must make it possible for the police to do well. We're working very hard uh, on that score. We are analyzing the uh, programs. We are meeting. It will interest you to know that probably for the first time in our history, the National Security Council meets regularly at least every quarter, there is a meeting of the National Security Council chaired by the president himself so that we can address some of these issues. We've improved upon our relationship with neighboring countries such that intelligence gathering from those areas uh, is also helping us. We've been able to get very, very reliable, very important intelligence from our neighboring uh, countries. That did not exist in the past. So uh, the challenges are there, but we believe that uh, we are on top of it. We believe that it's not gone out of hand. We believe that we live in an age where, because of social media and uh, the effectiveness of the media, everything gets over-publicized. You know, there have been instances where the media wants answers to issues that are being investigated. And yet when we are investigating, the only thing that we need is some uh, secrecy. And yet today, society expects that you give uh, information uh, to them. I believe uh, we're doing very, very well. And I don't lose sleep over whether the security situation uh, is safe or not. I think it's, it's very safe. Uh, it's very safe. And our tendency to absorb criticisms, I believe, is also very, very uh, helpful. We've reached out to people who have openly criticized, have asked for their views. We've sat down with them. Most times they realize, oh, okay, I didn't know about this. But most times we also learn a lot uh, from them. But have you just said that the first duty of a government is the provision of a, a safe, secure country, probably number one. We, we, we don't doubt that. And we have never lost sight uh, of that. This is a major challenge to us. 
Please help us. All Ghanaians, help us to stop this danger. I, w I said it was my last question, but something you said just occurred to me to ask you this. Do you think there are some people in the official SWAT team who are moonlighting as members of these vigilante groups? That should be against the rules. Once you come to work for us, moonlighting for the vigilante groups, obviously, is a very serious uh, offense and should be punished. I hope your investigation would cover that as well. I, I, especially now that you've said it, I will make sure that quietly we find out whether there are people who are moonlighting. You see, you. if you do have a, a soldier, well-trained, policeman, well-trained, who decides not to offer all his services to the police, to the army, but to moonlight and make personal benefits out of it, you are in danger. That is another form of vigilantism. It's another form of offering parallel security and safety services, not to be tolerated by any society. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister, just um, a suggestion. You give opening statements which were oral, and you have also told us about the discussions at PDRC. Specifically, I'm interested in the discussions and the findings on the causes of political vigilantism or the militia groups, their history, the way they operate, their misuse and uses. And uh, could you kindly give us a written excerpt of some of these discussions in relation to the vigilante groups? I, I, I think so. We'd be very, very happy uh, to share them. In fact, we probably should even consider uh, making it available to the public so that they also will come to appreciate uh, what is going on. But I do promise that I will give you a sense of what happened at PDRC to this uh, commission so that uh, you can have a look at it. The, what they consider to be the costs of it all, very, very interesting, and I think you should know uh, about them. Thank you. My last question. Normally, when people talk of the fight against these uh, groups, and when we meet to discuss them, I would wish to be assured that we always remember that the criminal justice system is a group, and therefore we always include the judiciary and the experts on the court system, the immigration, the customs, and other agencies apart from the police and the agencies under you, so that we think of them as solutions holistically. And then whatever we do as a country involves these other groups who can also help us to fight the menace. Yes, my Lord. And indeed, this explains why we made sure that the Minister for Justice and the Attorney General was part of this discussion group. And in fact, he made a lot of interesting suggestions bordering on the same things that you are uh, talking about. Thank you so much. Okay. Honorable Minister, thank you very much for your testimony. Just one or two questions. When did you get uh, the intelligence that arms were stored in a house belonging to the NDC candidate. I could mislead if I give an answer to this. I, I think the commander uh, will be in a better position to tell exactly when the intelligence was received. You don't have any idea of the roughly when that information reached you? When the information reached me. Yeah, the, when the intelligence reached, agency uh -huh. or service got that information. It, it, it's my guess. My guess is that it must have been in the morning or the previous night or so, uh, but it's only my guess. I think the correct answer, we should demand it from the uh, commander. Now, um, have you been able to 
get a search warrant to go into that house to find out whether those weapons have been illegally stored there or the nature of the weapons. Because from your evidence, the SWAT team never entered the house. No. And as of today, have you taken steps to find out whether the arms are still there and the source of the arms? The, the, this question was raised at, uh, at my briefing. Uh, the other suspicion is that the people must have run away with whatever weapons uh, were there. When they saw the police and when they saw that we were around, actually as they were leaving the, the house, uh, they must have, uh, they obviously took them away. But you an know? in depth in the investigation probably is appropriate to find out exactly what happened to the suspected um, arms that were there. Now, you say that um, the people who were in uh, this khaki uniform, all of them were part of the SWAT team. Yes, uh, my, that is my brief, that all of them, according to the commander, I have no cause to believe that he will try to lie to me on this, but see that all the people there were his men, the people that he normally works with. And part of the SWAT team are police officers? Uh, 25 of them are uh, police officers. So, uh, people have talked a lot about the vehicles that they used, that it, uh, some belong to the police. Yes, so there were some vehicles that had been painted as police vehicles because, in fact, they are police vehicles. And then there were some uh, pickups, I think. And is it therefore not surprising that um, police officers said that they were not aware, he was not aware of the people who were, um, who were the, the, the SWAT team. I mean, the people who were dressed, who were not dressed as police officers, but were dressed in uh, this khaki uniform and um, were armed. The person, your lord, who said that was the director general in charge of operations of the police force. And I have taken the uh, liberty to ask him, why did you say this? His answer to me was, that, Minister, I had just got it out of my car. And he posed that question. At that point in time, I did not know anybody. So I said something to that uh, effect. So again, probably worth uh, interrogating, but he's probably the best person to give that explanation. Um, Honorable Minister, these masks, you say that um, it is not unusual for security operatives to wear these masks. In, um, could you tell me the circumstances under which it becomes expedient or necessary for them to put on masks? I think at times they try to make themselves look fearsome. Um, as I said, there have been instances where they have paraded with these hoods on. Uh, uh, what does it really mean? Is it an attempt to hide themselves from the public? Uh, I think uh, to the extent that the commander knows the people that he's working with, there can be no question of hiding yourself. If anything happens, the commander will know who uh, did it. If as part of our culture, we want to discourage that, yes, we, we, will, we will look at that. I'm not sure what effect it can have on the effectiveness of our security agencies if you were to rule that in future um, anybody, policeman, or even a civilian operative on assignment should not mask the face. We are very happy to look at it. Uh, I can discuss this with my experts and see what effect it has. Definitely, you can give the assurance that um, we would not see that.
When I consider this a very mature advice, I certainly should uh, try to work for it. Mm -hmm. I understand it with my respect, and I, I can see, uh, with all due respect, the, the wisdom in that because of that fear and panic that it creates. I, I, I will examine it with my experts. Uh, okay, now you said, you said you saw on television uh, that Mr. Sam George was assaulted. You saw. That's what it is. That was something you saw on television. I saw it, and uh, I've also been given a report. Not a written report. I, I've been briefed uh, on it, and I'm told that uh, this this young uh, operative had only said that, uh, honourable member, please stop creating fear and panic. Nobody was killed, but you communicate to the whole world that somebody has died and that you've seen him with your eyes. The operative is saying he was then uh, insulted by the um, honorable member. I have specifically said at the, uh, at the briefing, and I've told the commander my views about it, that should an insult of a security officer a policeman, a soldier, lead to a, an assault on a citizen, I think uh, uh, looking but at. You would admit that the assault is a criminal offense? Uh, an assault yes. is an offense. Yes. Yeah. And so. I've said to them, to what extent is it right for you to assault somebody because of provocation. So that's why probably uh, we, we should look into that. As we speak today, the person who assaulted him, has he been arrested? No, not uh, as far as I know. Why not? Well, that... Th th that arrest will normally come from the uh, police service. It will be interesting for me to find out why, why he has not been arrested so far. Probably as part of their investigation, they've not found cause for him to be arrested. But I will find out. What about those who suffered injuries? I, I understand that um, at least six people were sent to the East mm. Legon Police Station. Mm. Have you found out how they sustained the injuries or who caused the injuries? Yes, we demanded that a team from the national security, uh, not just the SWAT people, should try to find out for us the, um, the injuries that they had and to see whatever um, support we can give uh, to them, but that should not stop the investigation that is crucial to establish what led to it and where people have to be sanctioned uh, for perpetrating uh, such acts. So the investigations uh, should go on, I think. So as that now, you don't know exactly who caused the injuries to those civilians. No, as at now, the brief that they gave us wasn't able to say, not that we didn't ask, but the commander wasn't able to say that it was this man, that man. It was more of a scaffold involving so many uh, people. Uh, remember, about 15 people on motorbikes, there were people in the house already. These people also numbered about 60 in all. Uh, a little bit of confusion was there. But we need to be able to unravel it. And I believe the uh, security agencies should be able to assist, uh, especially the police, uh, what went wrong. The, the beauty of this whole exercise, uh, my Lord, is that we are able to pinpoint who misconducted himself and 
uh, accordingly sanctioned. So, getting to the root of all this, we believe is very essential. And don't you think it will instill public confidence if that is done as quickly as possible and those responsible are arrested? I, I believe so. And uh, probably that was the... Uh, that was one of the reasons why we wanted the work of this commission and whatever other investigation is being conducted within the security agencies all to be concluded say within a month so uh, we can be we, we, we can be able to do whatever is necessary in terms of sanctions a quick response will put a lot of uh, restore a lot of confidence in the Ghanaian people now Honorable Minister, you are aware that there is a perception out there that these vigilante groups belong to political parties. Well, the CDD is challenging that. But, uh, my Lord, it is true that name the, uh, the vigilante group and we will be able to tell you what political party it's related to. Whether it is then owned by the political party or some big wigs of the political party, the first thing remains that the vigilante groups do have an association or are related to some uh, political uh, but I think it's useful as the, the honorable me uh, member suggested that we get you a, a copy of this report because my lord one interesting thing that he said was that the vigilante groups are also made up of the leaders. Whenever they have an operation, they go to a um, thugs market and take people from there. So a vigilante, some member, may today be fighting for a political party A. Tomorrow, it will be political party C. People just go there and say, hey, there's an operation political affiliation per se. So the, the study was good in that it brought to light a lot of things that probably we had taken for uh, granted. And they are able to prove that at this particular um, event where vigilantes were used, there were members who in another event had worked for the other political uh, party. They're getting more advanced. They're getting more sophisticated. We really need to find an end to this thing, uh, Your Lord. I would have thought that you're in a better position to find out who finance and um, we're working control, very hard on that. Control these vigilante groups. We, we, we are working opinion. very hard on that my, your, my... through your intel uh, intelligence services, so that if they are people within the political parties who are financing and control them, your intelligence should have made that information possible. We are working... saying that as of now, mm. your intelligence agencies don't have an idea about individuals in political parties who are financing and controlling these vigilante groups? Oh, look, it's been, the perception has been that these are vigilante groups owned, uh, funded by the political uh, parties. The political parties provide funding when there is an operation to be done. But when there is no operation, the, the members must survive. And the way they survive is to get financial support from these people who own uh, them. We are now using our intelligence capabilities to try to get to the bottom of it and find out who are the people behind the various groups, how are they getting the monies, how they are providing the funding, and to take the necessary actions. Difficult to give all the strategy, but the essential thing is that we, we, we think we should improve upon the intelligence gathering in finding out who provides the uh, passwords and the CDs. Well, thank you very much. Um, we thank you for your testimony and um, you could leave. If it becomes necessary to recall you, we'll yeah, do sure. so. Okay. Sure.
sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that was National Security Minister Albert Kandapa giving uh, his testimony to the Commission of Inquiry in charge of investigating what happened at Ayawaso during the by-election. There he's been saying a couple of things and tried to show his commitment to dealing with the problem uh, prior to this particular event. And, and during his testimony, he did mention that three days before the event, um, he spoke at a round table organized by the Peace Council and uh, the British uh, government on issues of political vigilantism. He also mentioned uh, that he was at a program at Pediasa when this commission was constituted to look into this matter. He was asked about the relationship between himself and the Minister of State in charge of national security. Now, you may know by now that uh, the Minister of State in charge of national security has mentioned that these men were deployed uh, from the national security outfit and he was asked if you know such or whether um, this national security minister at the presidency takes instructions from him and he says yes but not all the time and um, he's also been asked how uh, members of of the national security uh, operatives are chosen or recruited he mentioned that the people who were masked were comprised of two different people. So 25 of them from the police service and about 35 who are civilian national security operatives. And he says that none of the civilian national security operatives were armed. And if there were any, of, of any member of that group that was armed, it would be that they were from the police um, service. It, Obviously, if you've been watching, you would recall the first person to testify uh, was the Interior Minister, Ambrose Derry, and he mentioned that the vehicles that were branded police being used by these operatives did not belong to the Ghana Police Service. The National Security Minister has actually given an opposite testimony to that. He says it actually belongs to the Ghana Police Service and says that uh, the national security operators use vehicles sometimes from the national, uh, 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 from their own pool of vehicles and also from the Ghana Police Service. Asked why the Interior Minister and or the IGP would give, uh, um, you know, a different testimony to that or counter that um, claim. He said, well, it is possible that they may not be aware and that uh, at um, every point the, there's a unit of the Ghana Police Service deployed to the national security and they don't report directly to the director of operations at the Ghana police and so it's possible that they were there working with the national security as police officers but the director of operations of the Ghana police service will not be aware of what they were doing at that moment and he was asked how these people are recruited and he said well when they show interest uh, there's always a limited number didn't give too much details on that but you've been watching our live coverage of the first year of the Commission of Inquiry into the Ayaraso West Wogan by election violence. And it's been interesting. If you missed any part, you can catch up on YouTube. Uh, it will be uploaded there on the Joy News channel, also on myjoyonline.com. Just go there, furnish yourself with details. Just a lot of it. Stay with us here on the Joy News channel because in subsequent bulletins, we'll be doing a lot of analysis. For example, where the Interior Minister says there was no police officer who was armed. Well, we have video evidence showing some police officers armed and there are a couple of other issues like that that there would be analysis questions will be asked and um, a lot more will be gotten from what we've heard so far from the commission of inquiry but for now that will be it from me benis abubedu lamsa do log on to myjoyonline.com for more news i really really appreciate your company enjoy the rest of your day